Well, again, good morning, everybody. It is Chapel Day, and I am out here. I got Mr. Z's class here behind me. You can probably hear him, and there's probably some people waving at you. Today, we are actually going to be talking about arrogance, okay? And what arrogance is, is thinking that you're better than everybody else. In my day, we used to call it being conceited or being stuck up or having your nose in the air. But it's really just this feeling about thinking that you're better than everybody else around you. So, in just a few minutes, we're going to, a few seconds, we're going to join Miss Sims and the worship team. And then we will join each other again in worship. So, I will see you then. Aloha.
Welcome back, everybody. Again, we are in the gym, and we are running on our Alpha and Omega schedule. Now, last week, we talked about pride and humility. Today, we're going to be talking about an attribute similar to pride. It's called arrogance. Now, have you ever met anyone that is constantly boasting and bragging about themselves? I had a roommate in college. His name was Donald. Now, he drove a beautiful brand new Corvette car. Nice sports car. I think they cost about $60,000 today. His sister drove a Ford Thunderbird, which was another extremely expensive car. And their house, their family had a house. Uh, I'm from Charleston, South Carolina. It was right on the beach on the Atlantic Ocean. Huge house. It was palatial. And you know, Donald was also a state, state champion wrestler in high school. And so for my first semester of college, him and I just got paired together as roommates. I don't know why. And none of those things made Donald a bad person. But he always had to tell everybody how rich he was. He always had to brag about his car and what his sister was driving. He always had to brag about, you know, that no matter what kind of trouble he got into, his daddy was rich enough to get him out of it or just to make everything right again. And my first question to you this morning is, do you know anybody like that? Do you know anybody that is just totally arrogant and just totally, well, we used to call it conceited or stuck up or anyone like that? Because James actually talks about people like this. You know, don't forget, James is writing this letter to people that have been dispersed all over the Roman world. They have been discriminated against. They have been persecuted. They have been turned away. And they have been bullied. And they have been bashed. And many of them would have seen what the Jewish establishment had done to Jesus. The rulers of this Jewish community were so jealous that they lied about Jesus so that the Romans would murder him by nailing him to a cross. And the recipients of this letter would have seen one of the first leaders of the church, his name was Stephen, uh, lied about also, and then he was dragged outside the city, and then they threw rocks at him until he was dead. And then they would have known about this Pharisee, this really well-known Jewish leader. And his name was Saul. And he had received letters from the high court to go out and find any Christian that he could and drag them back to Jerusalem for punishment. You know, even in these trying times, James addresses this boasting and this bragging that some Christians fell into. And James tells him this, and I'm going to be reading from the letter from James again, chapter 4, verse 13. And he says, Now listen, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go into this or that city, spend a year there, and carry on business and make money. Why, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast and brag. All such boasting is evil. Anyone, then, who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. You see, in James's world, much like our own, people did not know what, what would happen in the next few days. And I'm sure that they wanted to get back to what they thought was normal also. And, you know, so what is normal in a middle schooler's life? Well, back seven months now, seven months ago, right before spring break, many of us had plans to take a trip on spring break. Maybe you were planning on going to Japan, going to California, going to Disney World, maybe one of those. You know, many of y'all were like super, super, super busy. And, you know, you would get to school at about 6.15, at 2.45, it's time for sports. And let's see here, oh, that was uh, track season back then. And, you know, you would do sports immediately after school, then your parents would pick you up out at the tennis courts or out at YPO or wherever you're training. You would get home at about 8 o'clock, and then you'd have to do your homework, and then you'd have to have supper, and then you would get ready for bed. And then the next day wake up, repeat. 
And then on the weekends, when you're supposed to rest, of course, there's, you know, like baby's first birthday parties on Saturdays or other family obligations that we all have on Saturdays. And then Sunday, if you are a soccer person, then Sunday is soccer day. Or maybe you had Sunday school, church, youth group, something like that. And then Monday would come back around. And I would be right out there welcoming y'all going, good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning. And kids would just come up and go, I'm tired. And so that is how normal was before. Have you ever thought that maybe that's not normal? Maybe that's not normal. Maybe we don't have to be that busy in our lives. Now, let me hit all of y'all with a little truth bomb here. Life changes, and sometimes it changes really, really fast. You know, and what we have here is worldviews colliding. And a worldview, if you haven't studied this yet, a worldview is really your philosophy of life. And although we all live in this world, we have many different worldviews. You know, it's easy to figure out what your worldview is, is what is the most important thing in your life? What's the most important thing in your life? Now, from knowing a lot of HBA kids, I would say that the most important thing in your life is family and friends. You know, but for many people, you know, their worldview is focused around money or wealth, you know, or it could be social or racial or economic justice, you know, or for many people, our worldview is formed around our faith in God. You know, this worldview is that filter that we look at everything else in life through. And this is how we make decisions. This is how we make different judgments. You know, James is talking here to people that are supposed to be followers of Christ, but their worldview is focused on something else. So they kind of leave God out of all of their day-to-day -day decisions. You know, the reality of God is ignored as they make these day-to-day -day decisions. Another word for this is that word that we're using for today, arrogance. Arrogance. Arrogance is a feeling of superiority or self-importance. And Jesus addressed this with the Pharisees in Luke chapter 18, starting in verse 9. And let me read that for you. He says, To some who are confident of their own righteousness and look down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. He said, Two men went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other is a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like that tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance, and he wouldn't even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast and says, Oh God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And then Jesus said, I tell you, that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. You know, there are some people who think they are better than others. And I hate to say this, but there are even some Christians that think they're better than other Christians. And in my opinion, if you think you're a Christian that's better than another Christian, you might want to reevaluate that whole Christian thing. You know, when I was growing up, I went to First Baptist Church. Not First Baptist Church of Pearl City or First Baptist Church of YPO or First Baptist Church of Charleston or anything like that. I went to the First Baptist Church. It was established in 1670 in the British colony of Charlestown, which is now Charleston, South Carolina. This church is the First Baptist Church in the New World. And when I was going there, when I was your age, uh, it was a very proper church. It was a very traditional church. You would not even think about going to church without wearing a coat and tie, even in the middle of the summer when it's 98 degrees outside. 
And I remember being in church this one time, and, you know, we're always told that if you see a visitor to go and say hi to them. And so this family, I guess they were tourists in Charleston because we're down in that district, they come walking into the church, and, you know, mom and dad are just wearing like a golf shirt and a pair of shorts, and they had their son with them. Uh, who was about my age at that time. And I figure, I'll go over there and talk to them. And as I'm on my way going, this one elderly lady on the church puts her hand on my shoulder and begins to squeeze. And I don't know if anyone's ever got you, you know, if anyone's ever squeezed you right there where you have that nerve. And she's just smiling and looking all pleasant and everything, but she's got me in pain. And I'm like, what are you doing? She's like, what are you doing? And I just says, I was just going over there to say hi. And she's like, if those people want to worship, they need to find another church to worship in. They're not like us. We're refined Christians. And what this woman had done is she had judged those people by the way that they dressed. She didn't think that she could worship God wearing just a regular button-down shirt, a collared shirt, and a pair of shorts. She was like, if you're going to come into this church, you need to dress in a coat and tie or dress properly. And I still remember that to this day because even I knew right then and there, this is wrong. This is wrong. If we call ourselves Christian, we know that we are sinners. We know that we're not better than anybody else. We know that we are just as bad as everybody else. And God does not care about the clothes on our back. He cares about the condition of our heart. You know, these are the type of people that James is addressing. And James tells us in his letter why you don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. And just like in James' day, these are the times that we're living in. Just personally, I watch the news every single night wondering what the governor is going to do about these quarantines. Because, you see, I don't know if I can go see my family for Christmas. You know, I know that all of y'all love your family. Sometimes you even take your families for granted. But I only get to see my family for about 10 days every year because that's 6,000 miles away. And if there's a quarantine, I can't come back to Hawaii and lock down for another 14 days. So I have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow or next month, or in the next couple of months. And so when we live in a world like this, now we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, the question becomes, how do we deal with it? How do we deal with it? And I think we're all really working with that right now. In the Old Testament, the book of Ecclesiastes, in chapter 12, verse 1, tells us, remember your Creator in the days of your youth, before the days of trouble come. Let me just say that one more time. Remember your creator in the days of your youth before the days of trouble come. You know, we want you to come to know Jesus now in your youth. Not just about him. We want you to come to truly know him so that when things do happen, you will already know who he is, and you will already be able to put yourself in his hands. You know, I could whine and complain about the current situation that we're in, but that's not going to do me any good. Now what I have to discover is what plans does God have for me? What does God want me to do? Quick example, a number of years ago I was on a flight from Honolulu to Atlanta, and it's about a nine-hour flight, and I can't sleep on planes at all, and I sit down in my chair, and I have this young lady next to me. She's probably in her late teens, early 20s, you know, hi, hi, you know, that kind of thing. I break out my Bible because, you know, I'm always writing sermons. I'm always writing sermons, and if you're on a plane and you put a Bible open on the tray table in front of you, nobody is going to say a word to you because they're going to think you're one of those crazy Christians that's going to try to make them a Christian or preach to you for the next nine hours. But whatever. So I got it open, and all of a sudden, I 
feel like someone's looking at me, and I look over, and the girl's looking at the Bible, looking at me, looking at the Bible, looking at me, and she just asked, what is that? And I was like, it's a Bible, a uh, new international version. And she looked at me real curious, and she says, do you know anything about that? And I looked at her and says, yeah, I, I know a little. And she said to me, my brother just died in a motorcycle accident. Can you tell me if he went to heaven? And so for the next nine hours, we had this incredible discussion about who God is, about who Jesus is, and what it means when we leave this earth and go to be with him. And see, for all of y'all, I want you to know Jesus now in the days of your youth. So when life changes, you don't have to get to know God, that you will already know who he is. You know, in this passage from James, the very last line that we're looking at today says, anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. You know, some people get caught up in day-to-day -day business and day-to-day -day dealings, and I'm sure you're busy and your parents are busy, everybody's busy, that we forget to do good for other people. And sometimes, even by our own judgments, bad judgments, we just turn away from people. Many years ago, before I was even here at HBA, I used to run the path that's in Blaisdell Park, which is at the north end of uh, Pearl Harbor. I might have told you this story before, but I'll tell it again. And I was coming along that path, and I saw this group of, they're probably eighth or ninth graders, a uh, group of about five to seven of them. And they're talking loud and brash, and they're cussing, and the boys have got their hats on crooked or sideways, and, you know, their pants are down on their hips, so their underwear is showing. And they thought they were being big and bad and all kind of stuff like that. And I come running over the bridge where they are, and all of a sudden I hear this one little girl that is with them say, hey, mister, you got a dollar? And I'm thinking, I'm not giving these kids a buck, you know, bunch of little, you know. Anyway. And I kept on running, and then I heard this little girl say, I just needed to catch the bus home. But I kept on riding. You see, I had already judged these kids. I was being arrogant. And by the time I got another couple of hundred feet, I guess, it just hit me. Here's some little girl just trying to get home, and she needs a dollar to get home. And I got a dollar. So I went back over there just to help this little girl out. And by the time I got back to where I was, they were gone. And I still remember that to this day because I had the opportunity to help out a little girl. But because of my own arrogance, I didn't do it. I didn't. And this is the sin of omission. You know, a lot of times we talk about sins that we commit. Well, sometimes we can sin by not doing something we know that we ought to do. And so this is what I want to leave you with today. First of all, I want to ask you, has there been a time that someone has been arrogant to you, that someone has looked down on you? Maybe it's because of your age. Maybe it's because of where you come to school or even where you live or something like that. How did that make you feel? Second, I want you to think about, do you really know God or do you just know about him? Do you really know him or do you just know about him? You know, we can know a lot about a lot of people. We can know about George Washington or Lincoln, but we never really know them. But Jesus is a person that we can truly know. And last, I want to ask you, has there ever been a time that you have not done something that you know that you should do, and afterwards you felt really bad about it, like what I did? Is there a time that you knew what you should do, but you didn't do it because of some other reason? Would you do anything differently now?
Okay. Well, let me pray for you, and then I'll let you go. So bow your heads with me, please. Father in heaven, I just pray for these students and these teachers that you would help them not to be arrogant, Lord, but, Father, that you could keep them humble before you. That, Lord, that we may look at your word and come not just to know about you, because knowledge is never enough, but come to truly know who you are and what you have done for us. I pray that each one of these students, Lord, can come to know you in the days of their youth before the days of trouble come. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, guys, well, I will be seeing you around here at the school when you're an Alpha or an Omega. Um, be seeing you in chapels. Just want you to know we love you guys out there. Take care of yourself. Take care of your family. Okay? Take care.